So I have to say, I'm <laughs> kind, of, kind of in awe of the statistics around PyTorch. And I think when we, um, why is there a number here? That's weird. Um, huh, weird. Um, let's get rid of that. I'm incredibly anal retentive. Uh, you know, when we were, um, oh, weird. Actually, something happened here. Uh, let me just, there we go. Aha. Uh -huh. When we were conceiving the PyTorch Foundation, honestly, I, like it's amazing. Um, I mean, when, when I, I would say I, I, I pinged Jim on, I think, LinkedIn messaging. It was like, hey, we're, we're thinking about doing something with a foundation with one of our projects, right? We didn't tell, tell him which. And of course, he's like, oh, is it PyTorch? Please, please let it be PyTorch. Please let it be PyTorch. Like, like, I can't tell you, but we need to talk. Let's, let's, let's have a conversation. Um, and so, I, yeah, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm so pleased at the way it worked out. Um, we had no idea if it was going to be successful or not, if anyone would show up to the meetings, if anyone, you know, if, if, if it would grow. Um, and I think it was, the results have been spectacular. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm Joe Spizak, for those who don't know me. Um, and I'm going to talk about PyTorch, uh, a project that is near and dear to my heart no matter where I go. Even if I go to Google, I'm still going to love PyTorch, which I am, of course, at Google now. And I'm going to talk about how PyTorch became the foundation of this crazy revolution in Gen AI and LLMs that we're in today. And I think it's like the overnight success is like one of the ways that, you know, we think about it. Like in the last six months, this craziness has happened. But I want to talk actually about the foundations of it. I want to talk about like leading up to this, the last five, even 10 years of where all this came from, because it didn't happen overnight. It was actually born on the, the blood, sweat, and tears of open source developers, uh, people building libraries, uh, people merging pull requests, fixing issues, um, which is obviously near and dear to this conference here in, in open source. So before we jump into that, very briefly on myself, um, again, I, I'm at Google working on uh, cloud TPU mainly, but also um, I'm gonna be investing, of course, in LLM and, and large model platform, um, as well as working on some applied ML uh, work in, in my next, um, uh, next, I guess, uh, increase in scope, so to speak. Um, I also do a lot of work in, in, in the VC world. Um, I'm an exec in residence at Canvas Ventures, if you're familiar with them in Portola Valley. I also angel and as well as vi advise uh, companies like Lightning, Anthropic, uh, there's a couple of stealth mode companies I invested in uh, recently, um, like contextual uh, folks coming out of FAIR, uh, as well as um, uh, Renhouse, which is a, a, a former PM of mine who actually worked on PyTorch. Uh, so really awesome uh, group of companies I'm investing in and, and partnering on. Uh, of course, I was a founding a founder of the PyTorch Foundation, uh, where Sumith and I uh, worked really closely uh, to build it. Um, and then, yeah, previously I was at Meta for about the last uh, five years. Uh, working on PyTorch, building partnerships, um, built a large model scaling team, but then also built an organization in FAIR research uh, focused on math and science. So I have a bit of a full stack, I would say, background um, in the space. So this large model wave, I want to actually put this to some numbers really quick to, to actually give people an idea. So the old timers, I guess like myself, if you kind of look back in the 2013 time frame there. Machine learning was like this less than 20%, you know, Google search term where it was like, okay, this is kind of cool. And I remember at the time I was actually at Intel and I attended a Berkeley retreat uh, and it was a free trip to, to Tahoe. So I couldn't turn it down. And I came back and I said, holy, you know, uh, actually I'm on camera. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I said, holy cow, this is going to be crazy. Uh, ImageNet had just came. Uh, you know, I was surrounded by academics that were just pushing the state of the art. I met Yanqing Jia, who was building Cafe at the time, which ended up being a foundation of Facebook's machine learning, of a lot of other companies, Yahoo's uh, machine learning uh, at scale. And you can see, um, you know, like it was kind of, it was, it was perceptible, but it wasn't where it is today. And then you fast forward 10 years and you can see it's everywhere, of course. But what's really interesting in this data is if you look at large language models and you look at generative AI just in the last six months, it goes from basically being esoteric to just absolutely everywhere. So I think what's really happened here is we've we've brought it into the mainstream, chat GPT, and you know, we've now kind of hit virality to the point where my parents, who are the least technical people on the planet, uh, know what it is and they actually play with it. Um, my father's a criminal psychologist uh, for, for the record um, and he knows nothing about machine learning. 
he just knows that we have free food at Google, and he asks me about it every time I talk to him. Um, but he's uh, 75, and he likes these things. So, um, And if you look at it in another axis, you look at the VC funding, which is interesting, and you look at the, the scale, and just in 2022, you know, $2.6 billion invested in 110 deals just in generative AI alone. And this is going to scale even further because there's been dry powder in the VC world the last couple of years with the pandemic and, you know, uh, holding people holding back on, on investments and so on. It's, it's going to start scaling even, even crazier. And, of course, the amount of compute actually these days somehow dictates how ambitious you can be. So we actually see this kind of feeding frenzy with startups trying to get compute deals and trying to, uh, you know, secure the ability to train really large models. So this is actually poised to even go crazier. And I think one of the things that's interesting, so obviously being at Google, I have a different perspective now after kind of being at Meta for a while. Uh, you know, the attention paper, we all talk about the attention paper is actually the semi-inception point. It's wild to look at the, start, the founders of startups that have just come off that paper alone. You can see, you know, uh, well, I'm technically, Ashish and Nikki have actually left Adept. Um, they're actually starting something new as, as of a few months ago. Uh, but you can see, you know, Gnome, obviously, a character, uh, <clears throat> folks uh, leaving for Cohere, uh, Near, OpenAI. It's, you know, Inflection obviously just came public with, uh, with Pi. Um, but just the amount of money being raised and the scale um, of these companies and just the, the dispersion of the talent from that one paper uh, has been incredible. And obviously, it's given a lot of heartburn to Google uh, as a company because we've lost a lot of great talent in the process. But what we've learned is scale actually creates these emergent properties. This is from our Palm paper, uh, which is now available as an API. So if you go to uh, Vertex or go to a, the, our, our offerings now, you can actually play with this. And, this is, and a lot of this uh, progress is actually being pushed by these startups and obviously large companies as well. And you know, I, I have to talk about parameters. Even though parameters don't mean that much these days, uh, they, it is still one way we look at model scale. Um, but what I'm, I'm kind of proud of is my old team at, at, at Meta creating the Lambda models. They proved that you can actually do a lot. You, you can look at the 540 billion uh, parameter model from Palm, or you can look at GPT-3. Um, but with the new scaling laws, you can actually do a lot with even under um, you know, 100 billion parameters, or even the, uh, the models are being released by, say, Mosaic and others, even, the, even in the single digit um, param uh, parameter, billions of parameters. They're still quite capable. So I actually firmly believe there's going to be a bifurcation of this. And we're going to talk more, instead of parameters, we're going to talk about capabilities. And those capabilities are going to be, you know, there's going to be a, a smaller parameter count or smaller size models. Um, but then there's obviously going to be these world models that only big companies or, or people that can access a lot of compute can, can actually train. Um, and so we're, we're in for an interesting few years, I guess. But we're here to talk about PyTorch, right? So let me, let me get back to PyTorch for a second. So I want to give everyone a little bit of a history, uh, pers historic perspective on where things came from. So we started out, I guess, who was the user of Lua Torch? Anyone? This is going to date you, so be careful if you raise your hand. Because, uh, you know, yeah, OK. So no one's, no one's brave enough. Um, I tried it, like when I first, uh, in, the, in the early days, when I, I, I tried them all, right? I tried Theano. I tried uh, Lua Torch. Um, you know, obviously cafe because I had to. Um, but really, PyTorch was born out of the Lua Torch project. So Renan Colbert, who's at Apple now, if you actually, one of the more interesting things as an aside is if you go to the PyTorch GitHub repo, look at the license TXT. It's really interesting. It goes back like a couple of decades, actually. Uh, there's a lot of people who actually have copyrights on that code, uh, including many folks you wouldn't expect. Um, but this really all started, I would say, in the research world. I was at that ICML uh, where I think they were hosting uh, a workshop at Microsoft, and you know they announced uh, you know support for Python on Torch, and and that was that was it. It was born. It was it was kind of Python on on Lua, basically as a binding, and the goal there was to to basically be one with the community, right? The Python community was was really growing, was was diverse, had a lot of libraries. How do you connect with that? That community. Well, Jan LeCun will still tell you that Lisp is the best, right? You should go and use Lisp, even though no one uses Lisp. But um, I think Sumith is right. Sumith was right at the time, and um, and so was Adam Pashka, who was actually the actual developer who created PyTorch. Um, 
And I'm not sure if you can actually read that tweet, but that, that is the seminal tweet from Andre Karpathy that goes back, you know, I've been using PyTorch for six months now, my, my skin is clearer, you know, the air smells fresher, you know, um, I have more energy, right? Um, and that kind of started it all. It was kind of a silly tweet at the time, but it kind of set off this, this virality and, uh, and people got really excited and started using it. And then you fast forward a, a year or so here, and this is kind of when I joined from, uh, from the other side. I was actually at Amazon uh, prior. And we started to, to really build a community around it. And you know, Hugging Face was tiny at the time. They were less than 10 people. Fast AI was just Jeremy Howard and you know, whatever time he could get from Sylvain Guger and, and a few other folks. The open mind community around privacy. They were, it was very early days for a lot of these communities, but they were building on PyTorch because it was easier to build on them because it was Pythonic. It was, defined by Ron, it was just easy to integrate with Pyro out of uh, the Pyro team out of Uber. And then, you know, boom, we announced PyTorch 1.0. Uh, this was our first first year we, we did a DEF CON. Uh, and we started to, to really in earnest build out our partnerships. So you can see some of the partnerships there. TensorBoard, I remember bringing a case of scotch over to Google at the time and after they landed all of our pull requests. So you didn't have to have you know, a TensorFlow dependency, you could just, you know, from torch.utils and port TensorBoard and, you know, specify your log deer and you were like up and running on TensorBoard. Beautiful. Uh, TorchServe we built with Amazon. Uh, MLflow we built with Databricks. Kubeflow with Google. Obviously, Lightning was one of those projects that came out of uh, FAIR, actually, as an intern, uh, Will Falcon. And then, obviously, we started to see, see the demand for the production ecosystem start to take hold. So it wasn't like we were going into Amazon and Google and Microsoft anymore and saying, hey, please support PyTorch. They were coming to us and, and saying, um, you know, help us support PyTorch in our, in our platforms. And you fast forward all the way today and you see what's, what's become of that. You, if you go to Papers with Code, which I highly recommend that site, by the way, uh, you can go to something, um, uh, I forget what it is, it's uh, like, um, Trends, I think it is. If you go to paperswithcode.com slash trends, it'll actually show the framework usage and how many libraries and, and papers actually get, get generated by framework. And you can see that big orange blob in the center is PyTorch. It's just incredible. Um, ChatGPT, obviously built on PyTorch. We built that, that partnership with OpenAI. They went all in on PyTorch. Stable Diffusion, built on PyTorch. So the foundations are there. It's, it's, it's pretty incredible. PyTorch basically is the revolution. So, I do want to actually talk a little bit about, more about why we invested, though. So, you know, I, I get this question a lot, and it's, it's always, well, why did Facebook or why did Meta, you know, why did, why did they do that? Why, was it altruism? To some extent, yes. I think we built PyTorch, uh, you know, with, with that in mind. But, you know, there were six reasons, I would say, that we fundamentally, like, when we actually had to go our, to our C-suite and say, like, here, here's what success, right? which you have to, right? When you're burning hundreds of engineers and, and you're, you're uh, and at, at one point I was having to stand up in, in front of our exec team and say, you know, we are actually prioritizing, you know, the bugs that Uber is finding instead of our own, say, production teams. You know, those are hard conversations, but we actually were able to convey the long game. And the long game was when, you're, when you have a common platform and framework with the community, you get things like a timeline edge. You get to see in some ways the future. Like people were building libraries on a daily, weekly basis. I would get, you know, I it was a very small team at the time, and I would get these, you know, pings over chat or pings over Slack. Uh, people would want to get onto our ecosystem page, and you would see all kinds of new things happen, whether it was around computer vision, whether it was on NLP, whether it was new training loop abstractions, different tools and things that would make things more productive to use PyTorch, take PyTorch into the world of, of reinforcement learning, whatever it was. They were all built on a common framework. This was incredibly powerful. So we started to pull these things actually into, into Facebook. We started using them. Cornea was one of them, for example, in the computer vision world. PyTorch Lightning today um, is used at scale for a lot of the models. Um, obviously, software leverage. Like we, we took these, um, you know, I mentioned geometric lightning. Um, we took these internally. Um, hardware. So one of the, the things that, you know, uh, being kind of self-serving a little bit is by creating a ton of demand in the ecosystem, every hardware vendor was forced to integrate with us, right? So this was a nice little Trojan horse that said, okay, well, AMD or GraphCore or all, you know, and then it becomes much, much easier when you're on a common framework. Then you can benchmark, then you can evaluate. Um, so there was, you know, I'm not sure we actually 
ended up taking any of that hardware internally in the infra, but we had the option because we were on that, that same, uh, same platform. And then obviously there's, there's other pieces um, that are, are more, I would say, like vanilla open source, but controlling our own destiny was actually pretty important. Um, I mean, the rest is you know, recruiting and mindshare and all that stuff, but controlling our own destiny was actually a big reason why we did what we did. And you know, truthfully, TensorFlow, for example, was on the list of things, you know, one of the options we considered. And it was a, at the time, it was growing like crazy, and we considered it, and we, at the, you know, we looked at the governance, we said, okay, what happens when we're in a situation when our production team needs to land code, and we are at the mercy of some other team at potentially Google, right? Not a good place to be in. So I think controlling our destiny, we actually, governance, if I had to boil everything down, um, governance actually was a very, very important reason for the, for the decision. But there was one big thing that we needed to think about for this to actually all work. We had to take a community first approach. And I think we probably took this to heart probably more, more than I would say than, than most believed. And so if I kind of boil it down to a tagline, I would say, PyTorch needs to be seen as a neutral brand giving first class participation to every major stakeholder investing in the ecosystem. So this wasn't that, you know, PyTorch was an open source project that we kind of owned and held and, and there were these contributors out there and they were nice and we just kind of gave them, you know, the ability to access the code because it was an open source. No, we, they were literally on the same level as anything that was coming out of the company. So whether it was a library coming out of FAIR, whether it was, you know, uh, a new capability that was getting launched, a blog, whatever, um, everyone was equal. And we fought on a daily basis to make sure that happened. And um, we, we took that really to heart. And I think that's a lot of the reason why we were successful and we were. I mean, I think if you look at some of the projects over time, I mentioned uh, Open Mind, uh, Captum, we went to the point of of almost detriment, uh, Lightning, for example, you know, if you look at the training loop abstraction library, I mean, who uses Lightning today? Anyone? A few, few folks? Okay. So how many, who knows like about all the other training loop abstractions, like Ignite and Poutine and Catalyst and no, no, okay. There's a bunch of them, right? I, at one point I was getting at least one or two a week where people would find a cool way to abstract the training loop because we never had a model.fit in PyTorch and still don't today. Like there was no Keras like model.fit. And that was actually by design. And we had to hold the line there because we wanted the full kind of uh, exposed functionality for researchers. And if you want to use an abstraction, you can use Lightning or you can use Catalyst or you can use something you know, that, that is maybe a little bit simpler and easier to use. That's totally fine. That's where the community comes in. With projects like Open Mind, for example, you know, we were releasing our, our own libraries around differential privacy. There was a project called Opacus. Uh, which was a great differential privacy library. Um, but we actually went and shared it with the open mind community even before launch and let's figure out how to integrate, let's figure out how to collaborate versus going and, you know, and, and, and competing with the community. So we went to great lengths to make sure that we did take a community first approach. And I think it was actually really successful. And I guess, you know, the, the results kind of speak for themselves. I would say, you know, network effects is what I would, I would boil this all down to. And you know things like Llama or things like Open Mind or Lightning or, you know, these are the kind of outcomes we were looking for, and we were lucky enough to get them. But it, it came with a strategy and it came with a vision, and we we had an operating model and we had, you know, air cover and we had a vision, uh, and you know we were able to execute it. So why is this guy at Google talking about PyTorch? <laughs> so by the way, there's a few folks here from, uh, from my team, definitely uh, hang out with Milad and, and Shaheen. Um, you'll wanna chat with them a little more. Uh, they're definitely, uh, they've been working on PyTorch a long time, so definitely uh, chat with them. So at the highest level, Google is investing at every layer of the stack. We build silicon, uh, we build you know, servers and, and, and racks and data centers and all the way down to um, you know, to uh, the infrastructure as a service, both internally and externally. Uh, we have an ML platform um, that provides basically, you know, your kind of traditional things like notebooks and, and ML ops and all the way through to models as a service and, and to kind of agents that you can then deploy in your applications. And you can see it's kind of a full stack. So depending on what you're, you're talking about, we're, we're deploying more and more obviously models as a service these days or providing APIs for models like Palm and 
and providing BARD as a as kind of a, a, a platform for for uh, experimentation evaluation. So you can basically you can say we're doing pretty much everything you, you can in the AI space. I would say every kind of niche of it. And if you look at PyTorch, especially down in these two levels, um, this is really where we're investing. But what is it concretely, I guess? So this is a project that we actually started back in 2018 uh, when I was at Meta and, and actually working with, uh, you know, Vishal and, and Shaheen and Zach, and Zach Stone. And, and it, was, it was a collaboration between, uh, between the two companies with the single focus goal of basically supporting cloud TPUs, kind of cutting edge hardware on PyTorch. And um, I think if, you, if you're at the first DEF CON we did in 2018, you saw glimpses of it, right? Uh, we, we teased it up on stage, and then the following one in 2019, uh, you saw you know, myself and, and Vishal up on stage um, you know, talking about the more uh, broad availability. Um, but you can see, basically, uh, we made the, the project was available. Uh, we started in 2018, started to become available in 2020. Um, it basically uh, the core of this was a lazy tensor idea. So, um, you know, you kind of think about the continuum of ways to, to execute, you know, operators. You can or compile operators. So you have a defined by run, which is kind of the eager mode, um, you know, uh, way Pythonic way that, that PyTorch uh, executes operators. At the whole other end of the spectrum, you have something called AOT or ahead of time, full full graph compilation. And then we, we found this basically, um, this approach that's kind of sat in the center called lazy tensor. And lazy tensor is essentially, you're, you're really only executing, executing ops when you need to execute those ops. So it's kind of a, um, it kind of, it, it's in theory, it brings you really the best of both worlds. It brings you the performance of the, of the hardware, but it also gives you the near kind of Pythonic experience that you're, you know, used to kind of running in eager mode. Is everyone familiar with like lazy tensor or eager mode or eager mode in general? Okay, cool. Um, and then, you know, in, in 2.0, uh, we started to integrate that with Torch Dynamo. Hopefully folks have kind of heard all the compiler noise that came out with, with PyTorch 2.0, Dynamo and Inductor. Um, and you can start to see, uh, you know, really the performance for both TPUs, but as well as GPUs. So this project really, I would say, sits kind of just below the, the PyTorch uh, layer, it provides a, a pathway to something called OpenXLA, which is a new open project by, led by Google and many others, Waze here from Intel. Um, and this basically provides you kind of this open compiler uh, backend, which then can, can then uh, connect to any XLA device. And it doesn't need to be a TPU, it can be a GPU, it can be you know, XPU, whatever um, type of device you're, you're looking for. In fact, it could be even a mobile device. And then on the other side of it, you kind of have your, your you know, your, your ecosystem of, of PyTorch uh, libraries, just like you always have. You have Ray, Hugging Face, you have Lightning, you have the whole, you know, thousands of libraries that are out there. And so a lot of people ask, like, what do I need to do, like, to, to get all this great performance? Well, actually, the code changes are pretty minor. So if you look at what I kind of highlight here, uh, if anyone's familiar with, you know, setting a device in, in PyTorch, right, there's CUDA devices, GPU, CPU device, and so on. So you're going to set an XLA device, uh, in this case, um, that then would, uh, would propagate through your, your step um, all the way through, you know, uh, through your model. Basically, your model code may change like a couple of lines here and there. But the, the main thing is you need to import, say, the Torch XLA um, library and then basically set a device and everything kind of works from there. So pretty minor changes. But what we get is actually a lot of performance. And so um, I actually expected GPU data on this, Malad, but I never got it. Uh, but this is all TPU data, uh, and this is all latency. So we've actually been um, doing a number of optimizations for Llama, for example, working with the Meta team, even at 175 billion parameters, which is, of course, the GPT-3 scale, uh, the latency is incredible. Um, and this is, I think, probably an order of magnitude lower than what the original uh, latency was. So I think it was around 200 milliseconds. And, now you can actually unlock the ability to actually serve um, you know, these models, these large language models at scale. And of course, latency for 7 billion is like negligible, right? Three milliseconds. So incredible performance um, for both TPUs and, and GPUs. So uh, I'll cover a little bit about ways to get involved, but honestly, this is all motherhood and apple pie if you're an open source person. Um, so I'll go through this. And by the way, feel free to ask me questions. I actually don't mind being interrupted. So um, I wanted to call out a couple of things. Uh, so one, Jeremy Howard is awesome. I've known him for uh, ages now. 
uh, he continues to build his courses uh, on on uh, PyTorch. And so he just actually released uh, fairly recently the practical deep learning course. Uh, he moved in his family all the way back to Australia. Um, he's but he's still advising and still you know heavily involved in community. I highly recommend taking his course. So way number one of getting involved: take a class or take a take a MOOC or play with tutorials. PyTorch has incredible tutorials. When I was there, we worked really hard to make them great. Uh, the 60 minute blitz is still probably the most popular thing I think on the PyTorch website. Uh, and that, that is, 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 you know, at this point, uh, quite a few years old. Um, the coolest thing I think that we actually did on the tutorials when I was with PyTorch is we actually had CoLab integration. So who uses CoLab? Okay, I'm gonna see some hands this time, hopefully, all right. So CoLab was amazing. So one of the things that I did um, with my team at Meta was we taught a class, a master's level course at Georgia Tech on deep learning that we then brought into something called the AI Learning Alliance to drive more diversity into AI. We taught that course almost entirely in CoLab. And then the students would actually go and pay the 50 bucks for CoLab Pro and get you know, a better GPU and, and a longer runtime. And it was, it was absolutely incredible. So you can actually click through on most of the tutorials on PyTorch.org right into CoLab and you can start playing with code right there. You don't need to spin up a VM or pull out your you know, credit card or whatever, it just works, it's beautiful. And there's, of course, GPUs available for free. Sure. So I would definitely check that out. Another thing you can do is you can compete in a Kaggle competition. So this is kind of a cool, well, it's a bit bittersweet, but mostly cool uh, graph on the left here. This is actually deep learning um, usage on Kaggle of PyTorch versus TensorFlow. And you can see that dark blue, by the way, is PyTorch. So PyTorch is everywhere in Kaggle, which is pretty awesome. I was actually looking through the challenges when I was putting these slides together. Um, there's a million dollar challenge. It's got a baseline in PyTorch if you wanna play with it and try and win a million dollars um, on the Vesuvius challenge, the ink detection, um, go for it. Uh, Kaggle has really incredible statistics. They have 13 million users, a uh, million monthly. Um, they have up-to-date PyTorch 2.0 uh, Docker images, 36,000 monthly PyTorch users on Kaggle. So it's pretty cool um, and the challenges are awesome. And obviously it's a great badge of honor to, to, to win a competition on Kaggle. And I think lastly, just again, Motherhood and Apple Pie, host a meetup or join a meetup. Um, I saw Imad, uh, it's stability is gonna be hosting one, I think in two weeks in New York over at uh, the Lightning AI office. Um, so, you know, join a meetup, get involved in the community, come to these events, right? Um, talk about your work. I think, you know, we've been blogging a lot, obviously with the LF, um, it's been awesome. The, I hate to say how the old blogging used to do. We, basically, it was a pull request that I used to just merge myself, which was dangerous. Um, it was a loophole in the system. But talk about your work. Uh, you know, reach out to the LF folks. It's, it's been actually pretty incredible. We've been blogging uh, from the Google side on PyTorch.org. Tell your story. There's actually a community stories um, uh, page as well. And you can you know, basically talk about your work, talk about you know, things that you built, um, and so on. And if I can help in any way, either personally, or if it's from Google, uh, whatever, I'm happy to help. Um, I, I love building this community and I'd love to, to help tell your story as well. That is it, thank you, and I can answer any questions you have.